Next item, 63 Main Street, due to chair. Yes, sir. Uh, sorry, open forum. Newts. Did I miss? Oh, yeah. Okay. Open forum. You got Joe. Yes, Mr. Chair. So, uh, as you might note, 63 Main Street has been rescheduled to your May 15th meeting. Um, and just wanted to remind everyone that the rescheduled annual town meeting will be on April 27th on Saturday at Westbury Academy Field, weather pending, um, at 9 a.m. So, it'll be a similar uh, check in process starting at 8 a.m., um, but the meeting is planned to start at 9 a.m. on the field on April 27th. And if there are any updates to that, uh, we encourage people to go to the town's website, the town meeting section, and they'll probably post updates there. So, so if there's anybody here for 63 Main Street hearing, you can go home because it's not happening tonight. Doesn't look like. Yes, Ellen. I just want to mention: is there not a rain date for Sunday if it rains on the 27th? I thought I read that. I thought that was the case. That is true. Okay. Thank you with subsequent rain dates of May 4th and 5th. Okay. <laughs> wow. Over sunshine. Okay, how about some meeting minutes of March 20th? Anybody have any additions, deletions? No. Uh, just one. Maybe it's major, maybe it's minor, but I believe it up in the 102, 103 area. Mm -hmm. There was comment from the attorney that there had been some action by the planning board in years past. Mm -hmm. And I believe I specifically asked for names and dates and documentation. You did. And that's not reflected in these minutes. And I believe to with with uh, a provisor that that information be brought forward at the continued mm -hmm. uh, meeting or the continued action. So can we add that in, Joe? Sure. Requested by Mr. Earl. Cool. Okay. Anybody else have anything? Um, yes. Just, we have some members absent before you take a vote on minutes. Yes. Are you planning to seat anyone? So, David, we're going to seat you, and Jeff, we're going to seat you. Thank you. For the entirety of the meeting? All night. Thank you. There's only five of us. Keep it simple. Uh, so, can we approve these minutes with the addition of David's request? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. So now we can go to the agenda. Uh, second item, which is our first item, is going to be Zero Muriel Drive. And that was a continuation from last month. And I see we have Attorney Gould with us. Good evening. <coughs> and this is uh, Eric Jacobson. Jacobson, who is uh, representing the applicant uh, who was here last month, Jim Warren. I think I've lost all of my other computers. So it's just got me. Okay. Um, since the last meeting, we've done a little more uh, research and homework to bring to the attention of the board those things that were commented on. And I sent in a narrative concerning uniqueness of the property, the hardship, or the uh, claimed hardship, and uh, how a decision in favor of the applicant would not be more detrimental or substantially derogated from the zoning bylaw. Do you have a copy of that? No, um, I don't think so. Narrative, could I submit it? No, it was on. We have a comment on that. Yeah. We don't. I don't think we, I think we have one. So we, we have a lengthy. Yeah. I don't have a print of it. It was on email. Um, oh, it was emailed to us? Yeah. I saw it in email, but I don't know what it was. It was emailed. emailed. It was emailed. Yeah. yeah. When was it emailed? Uh, after. So after the close of business on Friday. Friday. So we didn't get it till Tuesday. Correct. Okay. So here's the skinny. We have a policy that if we don't get the information by Friday, by 4-4 before our packets go out, 
then we don't feel that some of us don't have the time to read these. Now, because it was a holiday on Monday, town hall was closed, so we didn't get anything until Tuesday. I do understand. I personally didn't get a chance to look at it. Mr. Earl has objection to the fact that it came in so late. Uh, we'll accept it, but it doesn't mean we're going to get to look at it. So I, I think that, um, and so I guess in that packet also, you had um, stated a lot of case law. I saw all these things, case law, case law, case law. Well, none of us are lawyers, and none of us have access to case law. So uh, I think the best course of action for us is to um, move this to the next month, have town council review some of your case laws so that we can understand what you're referring to, because to us it's just names and numbers. And um, I will caution you again. If the information does not get here on what day, Joe? So the Friday before your next meeting, we'll pull it up now for you. It's the 15th, so it'll be... So it's the 10th, 10th. is Friday. The 10th. What time do the packets go out? They will go out by the end of the day. We usually like to get it out earlier for you yep. to give you as much time as we can. I just want to comment that Mr. Jenowitz was very kind in reminding me and tickling me on it. And so uh, no fault of his. In, in fact, he tried to uh, push it earlier. Yeah, no, I, well, we're, not, we're not trying to blame anybody. It's just that uh, in order for us to make an informed decision, we have to have all the information in a timely matter in front of us so we can review it. Contrary to what everybody thinks, these high-paying jobs that we have up here, <laughs> we don't always have the time I get it. to look at these. Um, so does the board have any other questions, concerns, um, or comments before we move this to next month? Um, is, do, we, do we do that without any comment from anybody? Or do we, do we circumvent that piece? And, uh, no. I mean, there's it, some we, certain number of people have apparently shown up for this. Yep, and we can unfortunately, we expect some input from... So I don't know what the, the, the best plan of action is, whether we mm -hmm. just go forward without that document even being considered, or do we postpone everything and have everybody come back next month? Dave, if availability is, well, is we have with different, uh, by the way, we have different attendees tonight, so if we continue that thing, it would be different members, mm -hmm. perhaps. Without really getting into it, uh, I have scanned it. I think it falls far short of at least the request I made. And if, if the applicant is going to rely on something that happened, I think 1977, with unnamed members of a certain board with no documentation, that's just in, it, out of the gate, that's just not responsive and inadequate to any serious discussion of this request and I've been a, a member of this board as you know for some time and I have seen us decline not similar but well they're similar not same as this and with significantly more detail than has been provided so far mm -hmm. Jake? Uh, I agree with you in that we're gonna, if we just go forward tonight, I think we're going to need to have some type of um, discussion with town council, so we're going to have to continue it anyway. Mm -hmm. So to have that information before us, before we actually have some discussion on it, I think would be helpful. So I think it would it'd be helpful mm -hmm. to continue it. Uh, Is this feel something that town council's reviews? Is this a document that <coughs> we need to have reviewed by town council, or is it something we could so use our own judgment on? The board has um, some options. Um, I've heard one board member state that there was a lot of legal terms and things called out and citing specific case law, of which you may have zero knowledge of. Maybe it's you could ask a council to just provide a review of the 
various application materials. I know there's been some questions raised about what principles do or don't apply, and maybe we can just get a boiled down version from council on what this may or may not mean relative to this specific petition. So, go ahead. So we could reach out to council. You, we could ask them, we could share the information, see if they can provide any helpful information. And if they feel any of the cited case law is relevant, they could provide perhaps a version for you folks that we normal people can understand. Okay. So I know at the last meeting, um, someone came up and had the tax record printed out. And what you saw from 1923 to 2023 was the lot was assessed as an unbuildable lot. And so I had staff ask the assessor what changed. And what changed was is that the lot was listed for sale. The assessor assumed that it was a buildable lot and automatically just made it that way and upped the assessment. So there was no rhyme or reason or anything to it other than the town had an opportunity to make some more tax dollars and that's what they did. And that's kind of the, the, the that issue. Um, there was one other thing that was brought up. I forget what it was. Does that make it a buildable lot now? Just no, it does not. It does not. Oh, so there was also a septic permit issued. If, if someone's going to, um, we should probably get name and address for the record if someone's asking yep. questions. So there was also a septic permit issued. And once again, the Board of Health gets something put in front of them. They look at their criterion. They could issue a two-bedroom septic permit and not realize that the lot had not been deemed buildable by this board or the town or anybody else. They did their job. Simple as that. Does that make it a buildable lot? No, it does not. So there's been a lot of stuff going on with this lot that, as I say, there's a process. And the process hasn't been fulfilled very well. You've got to start with A and go to Z. You don't start at M and go to Z. So that's part of the problem with this whole scenario. Um, so I just feel that, and I think the rest of the board is with me on this, that we need to have some more conclusive evidence from someone who can read case law better than us. Um, you know, and then there's the question of the merger law and the merger act. And I think we need to have that explained to us from our council and see how that plays into this. So there's another thing that we have to look at. So going forward, I think the smart thing to do for us as a board and for your client um, is to have council review it, meet next month, and hopefully we have some better answers. Go ahead. I, Mr. Chairman, I just wanted to speak to Mr. Earl's comment about the plan. The recorded plan is uh, in the materials and is at the Registry of Deeds. I did try to do a search for that planning board meeting and try to determine who uh, the names of who signed it, who was on the planning board in 1977 is on the plan. But um, it, correct me if I'm wrong, I asked for a way to do the search, and Mr. Morris, that was kind enough to say he's tried to find the minutes of that meeting, and they don't seem I did go in this. to the town clerks, into the vault. I did go through the old uh, minutes. I was unable to locate that specific set of minutes from that, around that meeting day. So, so I just wanted to comment for Mr. Well, Earl, my I did only try comment to find would be no minutes, no documentation. No discussion. Mm -hmm. Well, the doc, excuse me, but the, uh, through the chair, the documentation is their signature on the plan. That is, well, that, that is a, uh, so an entry I, document I, that we're submitting. Expressing my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, so, go ahead, Jeff. Well, what I didn't know is there were folks apparently who did come out tonight. Uh -huh. I all I. We've gotten direction that you would like us to seek input from council. I don't know, is there any other information I've heard looking about uh, merger principle, the information provided um, from their, their council, um, how does that play in, in the case law, you know, guidance on that. Is there anything else that you would like input from council about 
Is there anyone else here that might have something that could change that if they were allowed to speak? I'm going to my next thing. So I'm opening this up to the audience. Is there someone in the audience who would like to speak to this for, against, or comment, or have something that we haven't talked about? If you do, please come up to the microphone, give us your name, and speak. Geez, last guy, last minute, you guys are very chatty. <laughs> James Sullivan, Zero Lawson Road. Um, I think a lot of the folks last meeting said what I'm thinking. Um, I would be opposed um, to this getting the variance as well, and I just wanted that to be noted. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Bill McGuire, I live on Four Easy Street, which backs right onto this property. Uh, I spoke last time in opposition to this, and I'm still opposed to it. Like I said, I'm retired, I'm home all the time. I look out and I see nice woods and peace and quiet and I really don't want to see a house there. But just saying I'm still opposed to it. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, um, Mike Gross, uh, 50 Lawson Road. So I was not here uh, last meeting. Uh, I did uh, get the, the opportunity to watch watch it on online. I appreciate everybody's input. Um, I'm also in agreement with the rest of my neighbors, uh, completely against this. Uh, from what I saw in the last meeting and then what council brought today, I didn't see anything different. So I appreciate the fact that you guys are, you know, operating the way you are, uh, completely against it. Doesn't make any sense. Not a buildable lot. Thanks. Thank you. Lawrence Ledoux, 1 Easy Street. I spoke at the last meeting and I talked about, I had heard the counselor here talk about hardship. There is hardship there. I, again, the board, I appreciate all the work you do, the volunteer work, and you know how hard it is. And if, and I'm glad that you're gonna seek legal counsel on this to review the material. Because my fear is, is it will have a huge snowball that if a hardship goes here for an undersized lot to put a home in everybody in the town of Westford that has that piece of property next to their house will be coming to the board saying I would like to put something there and when you say no they'll seek legal counsel to say I'm going to sue you because you allowed this to happen so that's my concern um, and again you're going to seek legal counsel review of this so that is a good thing hopefully after all this review this can come to a, uh, a closure. Thank you. So let me rest assured, give you some input as to your comment about um, <coughs> other lots in town. We take each incidence on a case by case basis. So if we vote in favor or against this, it's not going to affect anything the next time around that we do something. No precedence being set. At the last meeting, somebody stated that there was not a legal survey done on this property. And I walk by it all the time, and I still don't see anything that looks like official stakes in the ground or the kind of thing that you would expect to see a surveyor put in. I'm just curious. Was, Has there been an official there survey done? There. Yeah. So there are stakes and stuff? He's taking curious because it doesn't look like anything there so did, did you submit a certified plot plan to us there's a survey that has been submitted in these plans of what they're building to this board the Board of Health um, necessary for the well permit and before the building inspector so there has been a survey okay. anybody else there has been a survey done. I would comment that just maybe sometimes we need a little bit of a step back dope slap because um, on the staff comments, the staff comments from the, from the previous meeting, number five says, and it suggests that we do what we're supposed to do. Uh, in reviewing the variance criteria, criteria, staff recommends that the board make specific findings as to whether the applicant has or has not addressed 
all the variance criteria as part of this review, particularly the first criterion. So um, I think if you look at the criteria and we talk about <coughs> topography, the size of the lot, that's one thing. Uh, number three, uh, without substantial detriment to the public good, and some significant public comment has come here today. So I just think sometimes we go forward without backing up. Sometimes we avoid that criteria before we get too deep into things. But I'm not so sure that uh, with all of this we, we meet the variance criteria. I'm not convinced we are. So. With due respect through you to the chair, to you, uh, Mr. Kaziniak, the applicant has created a map of the lots in the area showing that they are consistent in size, many of them smaller with much larger houses on them. And so when you talk about detriment public good, I think that criteria is <coughs> at least addressed. If this board determines it's not met, that's your prerogative, but it is addressed. But I don't think you get to that criteria without getting to the arguments of uniqueness of the lot and hardship. And if you recall, the argument for uniqueness is that this lot comes about from a plan that was endorsed after the 1976 cutoff that the statute speaks to. And that's why I'm uh, troubled by the mixed messages that this lot gives and that the town has given to the lot owner and everyone along the way. Um, I'm not saying it's the town's fault. I'm saying that there was a comp compilation of encouragement to go forward and build on this lot that didn't get stopped by his lawyers, by his engineers, by the date on the plan. And those are the things I'm going to address as unique after town council looks at my narrative and sees if that has any merit to it. Then I think we get to detrimental uh, questions about size and consistency in size with the neighborhood. Yeah, I think it's totally the relationship with the neighborhood. I mean, this, this well, things things have changed. Back in the '70s, these were camps on, on Nab Lake. I mean, a lot of these were cottages that had been rebuilt, thrown down, and rebuilt over, uh, rebuilt totally. Correct. Um, so you know what was existing in 1976 or seven versus 2024, and the types of construction and homes that have been in the area. I'm not. I, I think it's 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 a, it's a a little bit of an apples and oranges type of thing, Sherry. Based on, I know those lots are all the same size. This one sticks out. <clears throat> I hear you, but I would just like to add for the benefit of the neighbors who are objecting to this, this will not stay an empty wooded lot. If this isn't allowed, and, and it may not be, mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Blazer's only option is to sell as a single lot, and he's on a small unimproved camp. It hasn't been updated for many, many decades. I think whoever buys it will put a five or a 6,000 square foot home there and take up the two lots. Two so, lots. so, I mean, if, if you go around the neighborhood, that's what's happening all around mm -hmm. the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. but I, is it correct that the other lots, the other lots are residential B, right? This is a residential A section. That's somewhat of a difference, so, right? Different. We're starting to evolve where we said we wouldn't go. Mm -hmm. if the criteria for the documentation has been met. I think we move on to continue. Yep. Yes, sir. If someone does, if the owner sells the whole lot and someone does tear down the house and put an appropriate size house between this lot here and the present lot that he lives on, then that meets all the criteria. There's no doubt about it. Frontage on both sides would be great. So when she brings this up, it would be appropriate if the house was sold with both parcels of property and there's a piece of property across the street with a little beach on it. But if it was sold and a house was built there, according to coming here before, it would be appropriate. And maybe it would be larger than what is there right now. But a house built on both sides of, of the, the lot we're talking about here and the house lot right now would be totally appropriate. And so I don't see where there's a problem here where she's talking about this, that someone will do this. I think if someone does that, uh, given what homes are going for and what people are doing, it's going to be the same as the other houses since the 80s, the 90s, and uh, it will be appropriate. That's it. 
that's all there is to it. But she's right. Someone will buy the whole lot and build. But at this point, he'll be within, they will be when the illegal coming forward asking for permission to build on it because they have enough, they have enough uh, space and they have frontage and they meet all the criteria and so there's not looking for variances. That's all, thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, We've heard from everybody in the audience. I think what we'll do is um, get a motion to continue this to the next month's meeting. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Okay. That's just for the record, that should be May 15th, correct? May 15th. May 15th. Yep. <coughs> so before you leave, you understand everything that we're looking for? You understand? I the, yes, I do. The time frame? Okay. Do you need me to sign an extension yet? I don't uh, think we probably do need an extension, don't we? We would appreciate that. Do you want me to do it by email tomorrow? Yeah, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, is there anybody here for 288 Littleton Road, Unit 4? Okay, can we have a motion to open the public hearing? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Tell us who you are and what you're doing. Good, after, good evening. Um, my name is Kelly Silva. I am a massage therapist and I own All Bath Massage at 288 Littleton Road. And I'm here today for an after the fact variance for a massage establishment. Okay. Um, there seems to have been a little bit of ambiguity and confusion in the mass law and the town law and what you need and what you don't need. Um, I certainly don't have any questions in my mind. Um, you have your licenses from the state? Yes, we've been licensed for the 14 years we've been in business. Okay. Yep, we have an established, we have a location license, and each of my seven employees are also individual, individually licensed as, my, as myself. Is. Okay. Does the board have any questions? It's just a relocation. Right? Yeah, it's an at this location, uh, 10 years this coming August. Anybody? Uh, we, we, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. I don't believe we have any um, comments, any complaints, anything um, in all that time. Anybody in the audience have anything to say in favor or against? Seeing none, um, and the board's all set. All right, so. Close the hearing. Yep. Can I have a motion to close the public hearing? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. We are looking for a variance of the Western Zoning Bylaws for an after the fact approval of massage estab establishment and any other permit relief that may be required under Western Zoning Bylaw. Can I have that motion? So moved. Second. David? Yes. Jay? Yes. Yes. Jimmy? Yes. And I will also vote in the affirmative. So you're all set. They have 14 days to write a decision. There is a 21-day appeal period. Um, you're already up and running, so it's not like you're building something and they could make you tear it down. So. Oh, great. Thank you so much. Okay, you're welcome. Business, 7 Kings Pine Road. Uh, before we begin, I would like to mention the fact that I am a neighbor of the Morgan Stearns. I am not within the red circles of being a direct to butter, but um, I do live in that neighborhood, and I think that um, I can make a, a, a fair and equitable decision on their behalf. And is council and the applicant all okay with that? No objection, Mr. Chair. Okay. 
So, can we have a, a motion to open the public hearing? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. I'm passing out a plan. It's the exact same plan that you have behind you. It's just I uh, colored some of the lines in on the AutoCAD just so you could see them a little bit more clearly. Uh, good evening, members of the board. For the record, Attorney Melissa Robbins from Farrell Robbins. Uh, also with me tonight is Jeffrey Morgenstern. Uh, as Mr. Chair has stated, this is for 7 Kings Pine Thank Road. You, uh, we're here tonight seeking a special permit pursuant to Section 3.6.6 of the Westford Zoning Bylaws. Uh, the lot is located at the very end of Kings Pine Road. I know you can't see on this plan, but we're surrounded by uh, residential properties and also right at the end of the cul-de-sac is land owned by the town of Westford. Uh, the lot is undersized. It's 39,468 square feet. Uh, the lot clearly also doesn't meet front yard setbacks. Uh, right now, the front corner of that property is 4.3 feet from the edge of the roadway layout. Now, when I say roadway layout, that's not where the pavement is. Uh, we actually had Meisner Brem locate the pavement, so you can see the pavement is actually shown inside of the roadway layout. That's the dashed line. Uh, so the existing dwelling is actually about 40 feet away from the edge of pavement inside of that uh, circle. It's not uncommon. Uh, you know, now you'd go to the planning board and you'd get a waiver of the actual construction of this roadway. The circle wouldn't look like this anymore. Uh, you probably wouldn't have grass in the middle but um, this is not uncommon to waive the actual construction of the bulb. Uh, what we're seeking is to go 1.1 feet to the roadway layout. 1.1 uh, feet is actually just that small bump out right there. Um, and as you can see, the steps are already in that location. If you go up a little bit more, and I've highlighted them in the dark green in the plans that I've handed out to you, those are the steps so the steps are actually already located in that setback area, 0.3, uh, but steps aren't considered part of the structure for setback purposes, so that's, not, that's why it's noted as the 4.3 and not the 0.3. Uh, just a little background about the Morgenstern family. They've been here for 35 years. They've raised their family in this lovely ranch built in the 1960s, uh, but they've decided they'd like to stay in the town of Westford and age in place. I'm not sure if that's a nice term or not. We had a debate about it at the office. But they would like to stay here and age in place. Um, in order to do that, as you can imagine, uh, you've seen the existing layout. These bedrooms are small. There's no uh, real accessible bathroom. So the way to do that, the easiest way to do that in this structure, is to actually turn the one-car garage uh, today into the master bedroom. Uh, there'll be a small master bedroom. And then behind the master bedroom is the bathroom. Uh, they've tried to reconfigure this 9,000 ways, and there's really not a way to have a bathroom with the bedroom in the front without that small bump out. We're talking about three feet. Uh, this is the only area that needs relief from this board. Uh, the area to the back that is going to be a sunroom meets the rear, the rear yard setbacks. Uh, the garage is 27 feet from Kings Pine Road, uh, so that also doesn't need relief. So really, the only relief we need is for that small bump out coming to the street. Now, I think it's much clearer, clearer on the little arts and crafts that I did that I handed out to the board. But you can see that we have issues with the wetlands here. Um, a portion of that house is actually within the 55 to 0 setback to the wetlands. That's everything beyond the red line. Uh, the blue line is actually everything within the 55 foot to the 100 foot setbacks to the wetland. I know that doesn't matter much to this board, the wetland setbacks, but really it does limit our construction area on this site to be really in that corner. Uh, we certainly can't go to the other side, and we can't go to any other portion of the house towards the front. It would be closer to the um, layout of that roadway. So really we're in the only location that makes practical sense to do any construction. And really, any construction that I do to this small ranch, I'm going to have to come to this board for relief because there's practically nothing I can do with this ranch that wouldn't require me to come here for a special permit, anything on the front side of that structure. 
Uh, the proposed addition will have zero impact to the neighborhood. Uh, we have no impact utilities, we'll have zero impact traffic, uh, we'll have zero impact to infrastructure. I did have uh, my client go knock on every single abutter's door. You can see that you have in your packet an acknowledgement from all of the abutters that they have no issues and no concerns whatsoever with this being approved. Uh, we did receive staff comments. Thank you for those. Uh, they incorporated some of the Board of Health comments. Uh, we have absolutely no concerns with Board of Health comments whatsoever. We understand the issues with the septic system. And if approved, we would agree to those as conditions of approval. Uh, we also received uh, DPW comments, uh, which are also reflected in the staff comments. Uh, we have no concerns uh, modifying the driveway to be in conformance with the subdivision regulations. Uh, really, we were trying to expand the, the driveway so we didn't have to have any sort of turnaround, but we understand DPW's concerns, so we can address that. Uh, if that is, in fact, a shade tree, obviously, uh, we would have to go through the proper permitting for that, so we would make sure that if that tree is a shade tree, that we follow all rules and regulations related to the shade tree. Uh, his final comment was regarding snow removal, um, and this is uh, something about the future. Really, if you look at the pavement layout here, the pavement actually goes into eight Kings Pond, which is across the other side of the cul-de-sac. Uh, but this cul-de-sac is at least 150 feet wide. So if we were going to need to, well, by we I mean the inhabitants of the town of Westford, reconstruct Kings Pine Road because this is an accepted public way, um, obviously we would have to be within the cul-de-sac, but there's plenty of area to build a roadway here that would get to the rear of these structures with no problem. Um, I know he thought that the new bump out would be within areas that could be used as snow storage or have an impact of snow storage, but it doesn't have any impact of snow storage where we are today. As I said, the steps are already within this setback area. And as a matter of fact, as part of this application, we're actually moving our driveway further back to where it's located today. So you can see we're actually increasing the area in front of the bulb where we're going to have nothing. It could also be used for increased snow storage. Um, if increased snow storage was needed. So I appreciate his concern in snow storage. We look at that all the time when we do new construction or revised construction, but in this instance, I think there's plenty of snow storage. Uh, so again, what we're here for tonight is just a special permit for an increase to a non-conforming structure on a non-conforming lot. Really what the board needs to approve is that small bump out to the front of the structure, which will actually accommodate the master bedroom. Uh, it really will have zero impact whatsoever and will still be well 38 feet from edge of pavement, pavement excuse me, in Kings Pine Road. Uh, with that, I will turn over to the board if the board has any questions. So let me start and say that at the time these houses were built, mm. front yard setback was met because it was only 35 feet. Zoning in that area has changed from the 60s. Um, I know this because when I wanted to add on to my house, I had to do the same thing, and that's what <laughs> happened. Um, I'm not concerned about snow storage. Um, you know, we've survived the blizzard of 78, uh, the blizzard of 2015. That space in the middle, that grass area, is about 55 feet across. It's huge. Yeah, it's huge. huge. Yeah. Um, and I'm down there all the time because I used to plow the driveway across the street to the, from this house. and. There's never been a time when you couldn't get around that cul-de-sac. And you're right, it, that cul-de-sac is probably one of the biggest ones I've ever seen in Westford. It's big. Um, so I have no concerns about that. Um, and I think as long as that, you, that bump out doesn't protrude into the right of way, which it doesn't, I think um, I have no problem with it at all. Any other board members want to comment? Yeah, I agree. I guess 40 feet off the edge of pavement. Yeah, it seems like plenty of space there. Pretty straightforward. I mean, it's no closer than what the stairs are. Oh, so, <laughs> no, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Uh, anybody in the audience to speak in favor or against this proposal? Seeing none. Um, can I have a motion to close the public hearing? So moved. Second. I, is there any order of conditions? I don't. Thank you. Is there any that I can think of? 
No, I don't have anything in mind. Um, no? All right. So, you going to say something, Jeff? That you, it sounded like you had a motion and a second, but I don't know if I you I second. Actually, yeah. yeah, but did you take a vote? All those in favor? I uh, <laughs> no. did now. I didn't remember a vote happened. <laughs> So as Attorney Robbins mentioned, we are looking for a special permit pursuant to Section 3.6.6 .6 for the construction of an addition to a pre-existing non-conforming single-family dwelling resulting in a front yard setback of 1.1 feet, whereas 4.3 is existing and 50 feet is required as of today. Can I have that motion? So moved. Second. David? Yes. Jay? Yes. Jeff? Yes. Jimmy? Yes. And I will also vote in the affirmative. Thank you very much. You're all set. That's Thank set. you. Good luck. <laughs> Mr. Chair, I'm going to recuse myself. Yep. Mr. Val, of course, recusing himself on 70 Boston Road. So this is, do we need to open a public hearing for this? Or? No, this is uh, merely a general business item. It's not a public hearing. Uh, this is okay. regarding a decision in past conditions of approval. And I think the applicant, or on behalf of the applicant, they're looking to ask the board they want to make a change they're asking the board to find that the change is not significant and to see if you'll make that change administratively and then also make some findings that the various conditions of approval are satisfied with respect to the current proposal before you. so attorney robbins you're up again good evening mr chair again uh, melissa robbins i'm here tonight for 70 boston road also with me this evening is ellen hardy from drew farmhouse inc and i think she would like to say something quickly before i jump into it yes so just to explain how we got here 11 months after we were before you the first time, um, and we asked for permission to renovate the farmhouse and also the barn for nine bedrooms, and that number came 100% from the limitations of the septic system that was on the property. When we went to the closing in November and had a Title V done by the previous owners, we found that there are two septic systems on the property, and no one had known that the one for the barn that was put in in 1980 was still, in fact, operative, and that's the one that has been used for the barn since it was built. That meant that the partnership that we've had the honor of creating with Habitat for Humanity and representatives from Habitat are here tonight had the chance to make the two homes in the barn three bedroom rather than one bedroom and two bedroom. And that truly is the demographic that Habitat for Humanity is aiming to serve. And so they are able to take the barn septic system, and you can see it's off to the south of the, uh, of the barn house, uh, toward 495, and enlarge that so that the barn will habitat will have its complete separate septic system, and the existing septic system behind the building put in in 94 will serve the five apartments in the farmhouse. It's really an elegant solution. And when we spoke with Habitat, I said, this is simply a matter of going to the Board of Health it's a board of health decision as to how many bedrooms are on the septic system, not realizing that your decision in May of 2023 had said that it could be only be nine. So it was part of your decision. So we come before you tonight to ask you to reconsider this because there is new information, i.e. the new septic system, and because um, of what works best for habitat in terms of the property. So I just want to give you that background. And now I will turn it over to the woman who wrote it. <laughs> well, Ellen stole a lot of my thunder here. So, uh, Ellen Hardy is here today. Uh, Cheryl Major is also here. I think she's here. And then Shayla Carlisle, the executive director of Habitat for Humanity. She's brand new, just got here. So, welcome, Shayla, uh, is also here with us this evening. Um, I just want to say, I know it's not the board's regular procedure to approve projects, not in my 20 years of doing this, prior to having a plan, and that was done as a courtesy. And we're still appreciating that. Uh, because we had to go through a procedure in order to get our CPA funds, in order to go to the planning board, in order to get the closing. Uh, and that was because, part, in part, because this board allowed us to move forward without having these final plans. So tonight, this actually is twofold. One is 
You get to see these plans for habitat. I think they're really cute. Uh, two identical units, one above each other. They're both now three bedrooms. And I can say also this is the first time I've ever found a surprise septic system in my uh, 20 years of practice. Uh, but I think the great news is that it's not for uh, anything bad. This will actually serve exclusively Habitat for Humanity, which is wonderful. Um, it's typical for Habitat for Humanity to create family units. It's not typical for Habitat for Humanity to create single bedroom units. Um, and I'm going to let Shayla just speak a little bit on behalf of Habitat for Humanity, but I just would like to echo what Ellen said to your uh, the zoning board's decision is that this has zero impact whatsoever as to your conditions except for the limitation in the number of bedrooms. And that limitation was only there uh, because that was the limitation of our septic system. So had we known that we had a surprise septic system at the time, um, we would have asked for as many bedrooms as <coughs> we could possibly get because then our two units could be two, three bedroom units. Um, and then we'd be able to get affordable families into the town of Westford, which is desperately needed in this area. So with that, with that I'm going to just ask Shayla just to speak for a moment if the board would allow. Shayla, please come up to the microphone, give us your name. Good evening. Can you hear me okay? Sure. My name is Shayla Carlisle. I, as, as you said, I'm brand new uh, to this affiliate, um, but I have uh, four years' experience working with a different Habitat for Humanity. Uh, I don't know how many folks are familiar with Habitat for Humanity here. It, it's a very well-known name, um, but a lot of people don't really know what it is we do. We do a lot of different things, but um, building homes, rehabbing homes, that's really the heart and soul of what we do. Um, we do critical home repairs as well, and I have to say I think aging in place is a really lovely thing to say because it's so needed in our community, so we do critical home repairs. But um, as I said, the heart and soul is building homes and rehabbing homes, um, and it's all surrounding the concept of partner building so we really partner with the families that we work with uh, they have to put in sweat equity hours and work on the units they have to understand what it means to build a home to purchase a home from us they have to understand their escrow accounts we make sure that we really prepare them to become homeowners and um, it's a wonderful opportunity for them to wealth build for future generations for their family. Um, and so I think the concept of partner building also extends to the amazing communities that we work with. And so we're just very appreciative uh, to Westford for this opportunity. And um, there are a lot of families out there in all shapes and sizes, but it is true that the majority of families that apply um, would be looking for a three bedroom unit. So thank you very much for your time. Before you run off, um you talked about, you just made a comment about wealth building. So one of the things that this board and this town likes to uh, look towards is when you get an affordable unit, we want to keep it in perpetuity. So is that the plan of Habitat for this? I believe, I'm brand new to this project, <laughs> but I believe that it is. Yes, and I can say, Mr. Chair, as I'm also legal counsel for Habitat for Humanity of Greater Lulz, I think it's a permanent position now. Um, yes, our goal after this would to actually go through a lottery so that we could comply with EOHLC requirements to get these units counted on the Town of Westford's inventory, regardless of the fact if we can count them on the inventory or not. We will be going through EOHLC, which was DHCD. They just made it much harder to say. Um, and making sure that these will be deed restricted in perpetuity. It's also what we did on Ellen's units for the workplace housing. EOHLC has a program for that as well. So now these also have a regulatory agreement on it so that the town can be assured that these going forward will be workplace housing and that, excuse me, workforce housing as well as an affordable housing component for Habitat. Two separate regulatory agreements with the same exact purpose. And that was a commitment that the Drew Farmhouse made in the negotiations that we had with the Board of Selectmen following the special town meeting in October, Scott. That took five months to do that, but we signed those documents in January. The whole reason that the Drew Farmhouse Inc. was established was to have every living unit at 70 Boston Road in perpetuity be affordable, either as a habitat home or as a workforce affordable apartment, and that will be forever. And we signed documents to that extent with the board of selectmen of Westford. I'm and sorry, going to the select board, Emily, will never forget that. <laughs> <laughs> is there going to be a Westford preference 
in finding yes. people to buy these units. Yes, yes. that is Everybody typical. Everybody comes here mm -hmm. and tells us that, and they mm -hmm. turn out this from <laughs> all the places in the world and not from Westwood. Right. We signed that document as well, Scott. That was part of it. And I would not have signed it as president of Drew Farm because it's why we established it. We want Westwood people to be able to stay in Westwood. Mm -hmm. So it's our whole raison d'etre. That okay. is very. And it's written down in a very lengthy document, also signed by the select board. <laughs> That is very typical of the habitat model too, is trying to maintain where families can live in their communities. So does the board have any other questions or comments? No. 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 See how quick they said no. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I guess what we have to determine is if this is going to be considered a minor modification to the original agreement. Yeah. Yes. Everybody's shaking their head, so I guess that's a yes. Yes. Um, now, everybody's happy with three bedrooms? Yes. Per unit. Yeah. Per unit. <coughs> per, yeah, per unit. Okay. And the existing septic is fine as is? Or is it? For which half? For the barn. The new the, the septic system that goes with the barn, has that been? Um, you said it had to be made bigger, didn't you, Alan? Yeah, it's mm -hmm. been, the design was just up on the screen, Jim. Yeah. It's been designed. It has been submitted to the Board of Health, yeah. and they've given their approval. That's all been approved yeah. already. Mm -hmm. Okay. No. Okay, so what do you need from us? A vote? We would love a vote for you to find that the change requested is not substantial, to approve the change, and to find that the requirement for providing the final plans is hereby satisfied for the two habitat units. Roll call. Uh, can we get a, a motion, motion a to that effect? Mm -hmm. Joe's, Joe's got to record that. Can I check this? Dave? Yes. Jay? Yes. Jim? Yes. And I will also vote in the affirmative. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very much. Okay, good luck. Good luck. Thank Thanks. you. So the, the next item that we're going to talk about is something that I've asked Joe and Jeff and staff to kind of look over and work on, <coughs> and it's, it's what we're calling board policies, and it's not that it's going to be put into the zoning bylaws or anything else, but it's going to be policies of this board. And in particular, I think there's going to be um, – a need to have some policies or restrictions or call outs and things um, in certain neighborhoods, i.e., NAB, around the lakes, the villages, uh, and e even other areas where people come to us on an undersized lot and they want to build a house. And I think that because of the nature of the town of Westford now, and what people want in houses, we've got little lots, great big houses. Mm -hmm. And I think it's ruining the character of a lot of the neighborhoods. Uh, I know many years ago, Lexington was having the same problem because there was a section called the Manor section. It was all uh, post-World War II uh, capes and ranches that were built there. And people were buying them, tearing them down, and building McMansions there. So the town of Lexington put a building moratorium on it. Now, I don't think that's something that we're going to do, but I would like to see everybody start thinking about what we can do about that. You know, one of the ideas that I had in one of the last things that we looked at, um, I wish we had had the foundation for the proposed structure staked out so we could drive by and look at it and say, geez, that's big. Mm -hmm. look, okay, what about this? What about that? Um, another thing that I had thought about is um, if you have an existing structure that's going to be taken down or remodeled, um, come up with a percentage of how much can be added as a policy of this board, not, a, not as a bylaw. So can, we, can you add 50% more, 30% more, 20% more, whatever the number is? 
and kind of make that a policy. The other thing I'd like to see happen is when people come to us on some of these undersized lots, have a minimum of that at least three of the four setbacks have to be met. Because a lot of times they come to us and they're meeting two, maybe one, maybe they're not meeting any of them because it was an existing structure there. Um, you know, the other, you can think about the height of a new structure versus what was existing. Is it going to be the same height? Does it have to be within a certain percentage of the same height? Other things like raising the grade of a lot. Can you make the lot way higher than it was there before? Some of it's going to be predicated because of engineering and septic, but um, I just think it's going to be one of those things. The other thing that I thought about is the number of bedrooms from an existing house to a new structure. Should that be kept the same, or should we have a policy saying, you know, we only allow one bit more bedroom than was existing? So these are all just ideas that I've come up with. I want you all to start thinking about different things that you've thought about. And as I said, there's, there's certain areas of town, and we've seen it already, especially around the lake, where you know they bought these small houses and made huge additions and built big houses. Um, <clears throat> and it's not that we're trying to stop it, but I just think that people coming to us, if they know that we have a policy that says, this board typically will only let you go 50% larger than what was there. Then I think they'll have a better idea when they show up here what to expect from this board. So if anybody has any comments or questions, I see David's mind working over there. No, I just, I, well, I was thinking, do we, do we know in the town of Westford how many two, three, four bedroom, five bedroom houses we have? No. That information? But we do have a, we, I don't recall the number, but we do have a sense of how many year round dwelling units there are. We know that as of like 2020, it was what, 9,237. Nine um, but uh, we don't have a sense of how many are one bedroom or two bedroom, three bedroom or four bedroom, but that could be something that the uh, assessor could go through. Well, I've, I've, you know, I'm just trying to, for a fact, there's been some sentiment at times that people didn't want more bedrooms because it meant more kids for the school. And it meant to uh, proceed that as being. Kind of a burden on the town, and you know, a lot of people have come here. But I think it, it, I think Scott's on to something. But it would be nice to know uh, if you first of all the overall number, and then maybe if you had it by neighborhood or by I don't know, cluster. I don't know how you you refer to them as neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's probably not a bad but you know I mean we had some discussion about a recent case where uh, there was quite a large structure put on a property and we had some discussion and not re not really any debate but I think the applicant sort of maxed out what they not only, I guess, what they could do, what they wanted to do. So I guess, just off the cuff, one of the things I would recommend is, first of all, we can gather some information about the dwellings, the types of dwellings, the number of bedroom count, etc. I would suggest that maybe the board not have this again as an agenda item until after uh, one of your ongoing hearings closes and you issue a decision for that. Mm -hmm. But um, I have heard um, some thoughts from this board in the past about, uh, so first of all, you already have a huge amount of discretion. You don't need a written policy to do some of the things that you talked about. Like if you wanna see the proposed structure staked out, can already say we want to see that staked out 
as part of our decision making and if we can't picture it we don't have enough information to make an informed decision but if you want to take it to the next step you know as far as like when people go and they look for the uh, application you know materials if you're looking towards having that staked out before you open your hearing so you can go and do a site visit and see you know that's something that'll be good to clarify up front so that's one of the things you can look at you can already require and it would be a courtesy to say hey do this otherwise you're wasting another month you know to stake it out and go see it and such so that's that's all reasonable you have you're never obligated to grant any variance okay a lot of the situations that you're talking about for undersized lots or non-conforming structures usually there's a special permit process involved and you have a huge amount of discretion with special permits again you're not obligated to grant it and you have a lot more latitude uh, with special permits than some other types of, of things. So I think, I think um, I get a little nervous when you say different neighborhoods. I think unless there's a different zoning district, like you've talked about in the past, like maybe it does make sense to look at some of the lake areas differently because I've heard this board say sometimes the yards, it's kind of flopped. Like, people look at the front is the back and the back and the front you know so maybe maybe you don't think it makes as much sense to not be able to have like that accessory structure in a particular yard maybe you think it's different you know it's also at odds with you know the resource areas and conservation so um but i've have heard this board say that you know before and i know some other communities have looked at um how they grant special permits differently like maybe they look differently for the first say it's a 15 foot side yard setback they might look differently at the first five feet than they do going past that first third, you know, of the required setback. You know, so there are things that you can look at. We can try to get some examples from other communities. Mm -hmm. um, we're happy to do that. I would just advise, since you have an active petition before you, mm -hmm. I would not have an agenda item on that until after that concludes and the appeal period is up. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I just want to get the ball rolling a little bit and get everybody thinking about this besides me um, you guys should all stay awake at night and think of this stuff instead of me because uh, I, I think that going forward you know as the town grows and there's less and less buildable land you know the teardowns are going to start and, and yeah, it's just going to be we've had a lot of there's going to be yeah there's a lot, had a lot. Of, yeah I, I think that the a couple developments the house is being 20 feet only 20 foot distance in between them it's almost like a clustering cluster development mm -hmm. i think they have to be spread out of uh, and i can i'm not going to name a few but you drive by them it's like they're too tight oh yeah yeah they're too tight yeah the, the problem though i think on the other hand you go to mcmansions i mean that this is exactly what happened when the planning board sued us on that property over on Long. yeah I, yeah. I see your point. so yes. so you could you know we talk about workforce housing we're essentially when, when we go to McMansion we sort of people get priced out of being able to buy a house and that's one of the I, mean, I think that's one of the I guess in Westford is no different than any other town, but you know, when somebody has a one bedroom house, somebody grabs it and the next thing they do they're trying to put on a couple other couple more bedrooms mm -hmm. because they can't that's the only thing they can buy into. That's true. Yeah. You know, we had, well I remember well rest his soul, Bob, they we had this kind of a good discussion over at uh, what's that that's the long sliver of land where they got there's 17 or 19 houses there uh, down on Granifo Road <coughs> yeah Juniper Hill Juniper Hill Juniper Hill yeah remember they got bonus and the, the the developers aren't dummies they were trying to they were trying to maximize the money they could make and they really were, they were going to get every damn house they could. Uh, and they wanted to make them as many bedrooms as they could. And I think we went back and forth. I think 
they didn't get as many three and four bedroom houses as they wanted, but they got, I think, because they got more than some people wanted to give them. There were, as I recall, restrictions on the number of bedrooms, and I think there were some restrictions on the number of bedrooms for the bonus units. Well, they made, they cut the deal with Habitat for a couple of them so they could essentially deal off the one and two bedroom ones where they could make as much money. I mean, it's not, there's not, I mean, they were just, they were being entrepreneurial. Mm -hmm. Interesting too, there hasn't been a lot of new construction like there used to be, right? So there was a lot of options for families a lot of families want to come to Western because of the school system. So I think sometimes that's how they get, <laughs> they get around it. They buy a smaller home and they add on to it to accommodate their families, you know, and that's a challenge. I don't know if we'll ever be able to completely stop, you know. Mm. <laughs> well, it's not that we want to stop it. I just think as to, to Jeff's point, you know, with with our variance criterion and our uh, special permit and all these things that they've printed out for us nice here, you know, the burden of proof is on them. It's not on yes, us, it's absolutely. on them to prove to us that what they're doing is not detrimental to the neighborhood right. and so on and so forth. We gotta be more vigilant about our criteria. I, I think you're right. Through, I, I think, think this, you know, these. That, that's not impossible, but we'd yep. be the first commandment. <clears throat> move on from that. Yep. You know? No, I agree. Yes. I agree. We're going to get back to those and start using them more faithfully. So, but anyway, to get you guys thinking about it, yep. that's what I'm trying to do. I agree. If you have any other thoughts or suggestions, if you want to just email us directly without copying any of the board members, we can add that to some of the research efforts. If nobody has anything else, then the next item is correspondence. Jeffrey, your name's on this. What's this all about? My name's on this. Yeah, it says Jeffrey Morissette. Dear Jeffrey. Yeah. Annual monitoring. Oh, uh, yeah. So what this is <coughs> for some of the, uh, the affordable units, there's uh, required monitoring that happens. So um, you may recall you've received these in the past for some units occasionally. They just check to make sure that things are uh, abiding. When there's turnover, they make sure they're still meeting all the requirements. So they're obligated to report. And so they, uh, this is just one of those. We usually just uh, put it in your correspondence. Um, Sometimes the reporting agent changes. Um, a lot of times it starts out as the Westford Housing Authority on behalf of the town sometimes. And sometimes a, a lar it'll get transitioned to a different reporting agency based on the state. So do we, um, so there was a resale of an affordable unit, right? Do we know what that sold for? Well, we can find out what it sold for, but what the, the certify and report is that it's, within what's allowed that it meets the requirements because trust me you don't want these people checking that you want our affordable housing consultant doing that mm -hmm. not I, us i agree with you but it's always not great understanding on how that process works you know what i mean yep. and it seems like sometimes ones that are affordable are no longer affordable down the road you know so in in rare what i will say is so for the units that are on our subsidized housing inventory um Westford is fortunate in that most of the units that are listed as uh, on that inventory most of them are there permanently okay there are some going way back where it wasn't in perpetuity it was for a certain number of years mm -hmm. and they eventually expire. And some of those have come and gone since, I, I think two of them have happened since I've been here at least. But almost all of them are definitely um, permanent. There's been a few occasions also whereby um, there were foreclosures and such at some older ones where the, the regulatory agreement isn't consistent with the requirements of today. And there was a question um, 
brought about if did the um, affordable housing trust did they want to um, continue that and at times there's actually a there is actually a disadvantage to doing so they the cost to either buy down or, or take it up um, they usually look at that on a case-by-case -case basis in rare instances they sometimes say we got to let it go it's not in the best interest of what we're using our, our funding for um, I know it sounds contrary and it's convoluted a little but we uh, had one of those yeah over there off a wood, not across a wood pond drive those ones Bob Cheney did you back in the day when no one knew what 40b was mm -hmm. yeah. Most of them are in very good shape in Westward because we did look because when we're when we update our housing production plan, we look at the SHI and that gets updated every year. We look to see what's scheduled to come off, you know, because it's aging out, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And there's only a handful of those that are not permanent left and there's still quite a ways to go. And of course, we as you know, we have a number of additional units coming on board as well and we're still above our 10 percent we've got the helena crocker residences that's 18 35 town farm row that's another 35 you know that insulates us against you know a good number mm -hmm. and if the mbta community passes we do have the ability to require that 10 percent of the units be affordable and count on the shi so we're not in the worst of spots for that i was just asking because i was just curious about what that initially sold for and then now what is it mm. uh, what's it's the difference in that price you know? it, it is <laughs> it is a moving target yeah. because they update um, what the um, area median income is mm. every year because um, it changes so uh, and it's not a simple thing like what's happening in Westford it's the region mm. so it does get updated and it does change and is allowed to go up you know sort of it all depends so it's outside of our control but so they just make sure that when it does that it meets the then requirements for the level of affordability so it's an area median income and not a town that's correct correct so at least we stand a chance that way well actually what kind of towns are in the area that's right so <laughs> some people may say it's fortunate unfortunate so it may be i mean the prices in westford are you know, Westford is generally a more affluent community than most of the other communities in our regional bucket, right? So one of the issues is um, the area median income is you look at all, all of the communities in the greater Lowell area, right? So if you're living in Westford, right, you probably have to earn a certain amount more on average just to be able to live here. And so there's probably fewer people or at least percentage-wise, that can qualify for, say, the 80% area meet income in Westford than you can in some other communities. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because typically they probably tend to earn more here in Westford just by virtue of them being here. Some people, you know, they inherited at home. There's always that, that situation. But if you just look at what people have to earn to just be and live in Westford, you know, you're kind of at a slight disadvantage almost for qualifying for the 80 percent ami as compared to you know the same set of rules in other communities in the same bucket so and that's why we think workforce housing is not necessarily a bad thing to explore and pursue for westward because we think there's more opportunity for more westward residents to be able to qualify for workforce housing it's still a valuable niche and need you know that our community needs and there hasn't been you know a lot it's most of the effort has been for affordable housing we haven't really been chipping away at the workforce which goes up to 120 percent of the area of median income i'll stop talking yeah that's good but in that in the workforce bucket the only th things i can think of that fall in that bucket are what ellen's doing down on boston road and what she does over at muffins on me are there others? I, in my time here, I don't recall any. Well, so I misspeak. So there is in your mill conversion bylaw, I believe, there's a requirement that 5% of the units be, I think, at 80 percent AMI another five at maybe 
a hundred percent of the area. I mean, there there was sort of a tiered thing, different levels, but that has only come up so many times. And in some of the mill conversions, even though they might be affordable, in fact, or at 100% of the area median income, a lot of them didn't actually qualify on our subsidized housing inventory, even though there was that restriction. So, but by and large, I can't think of many, if any, projects since I've been here that came in as workforce housing. What about the hot little ones across the street from where Ellen is on Joe's way? Nope, that's a uh, typical 40B, 80%, I think 80% of the AMI. So, but it is uh, something that I think is worth exploring. Mm. Okay. Anybody else have any other comments? No. We have a motion to close this meeting. So we'll All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right.